Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I recently completed the study on uh, refuting Paul onlyism. Uh, so now I'm ready to get back to uh, what are commonly called character studies. Uh, the first one that was done was on Adam and Eve. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from the uh, Genesis 1 1 and just go through this all the way through the scriptures and talk about all of the main characters. Now, there's a lot of people named in the scriptures that are, I would call, if not insignificant, they're less significant. But all the people that are significant, uh, well, let's look at the verses that mention them and see what we can learn about them. So, uh, all the studies I've done in the past uh, have really been uh, topical studies, you know, where you pick a topic like the deity of Christ or faith alone for salvation, or, uh, and then you discuss the topic. But this is a, a new uh, type of Bible study that uh, I'm real happy to start doing now. And so the, the next character in the scriptures that we find that is really significant uh, after Adam and Eve are mentioned, the next one is the serpent or the devil. So let's uh, talk about that. I was actually surprised when I just started researching this uh, last couple of days. The... Um, uh, I also was going to include the word Lucifer uh, in this study because I thought that you know Lucifer was a name for the devil. Maybe you think that's the case too. If, if you believe it is, then, then let me know and explain why. But what I found when I looked up the word Lucifer is uh, in, in the uh, searching the, the key word, uh, the Lucifer is found one time in all of the scriptures. Uh, it is in Isaiah 14, 12. And it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Well, the first thing I'll say about this is that uh, I was quite surprised that uh, the word or the, the name Lucifer appeared only one time in all the scriptures. So maybe maybe you're surprised by that too, but uh, I expected it would be there, you know, at least five or ten times. Um, but what I found when I've looked at this word and uh, tried to understand that verse. Uh, I look at uh, the uh, commentaries, and the uh, here's one called Smith's Bible Dictionary, and Lucifer translates to light bearer. It says it's found in Isaiah 14:12, coupled with the epithet "son of the morning," clearly signifies a bright star. And probably what we call the morning star. Uh, in this passage, it is a symbolical representation of the king of Babylon in his splendor and in his fall. Its application from St. Jerome downward to Satan in his fall from heaven arises probably from the fact that the Babylonian Empire is in scripture represented as the type of tyrannical and self-idolizing power, and especially connected with the empire of the evil one in the apocalypse. So what we get from that uh, particular commentary, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, is uh, no indication that the word Lucifer actually refers to the devil in this verse. Uh, they're saying that it refers to the king of Babylon and, and people are taking it as a as a type of uh, Satan or a type of uh, uh, you know devil but uh, 
Now let's look at uh, the another one, an ATS Bible Dictionary. It says Lucifer, light bringer. The Latin name of the morning star or son of the morning. In the figurative language of scripture, a brilliant star denoted an illustrious prince. Uh, see Numbers 24, 17. Christ was given to men as the bright and morning star. See Revelation 2, 28. 2216. The word Lucifer is used only once uh, in the English Bible and then of the king of Babylon. It's in Isaiah 14 12. It is now commonly, uh, though inappropriately, given to the prince of darkness. And uh, that's what I'm finding in all of these uh, commentaries and Bible dictionaries. Um, so if someone can explain that verse and, and tell me why we should think of Lucifer as uh, a name for the devil or the name of the devil uh, then uh, let me know because I was surprised to see that uh, I, that's not really what it uh, is intended to mean now it looks like Jackson is with me hey Jackson uh huh uh, have you been on one minute or two or what? About three or four minutes. Oh, okay. So uh, I was looking at, uh, I didn't see the screen when you arrived, uh, or I wasn't trying to ignore you, but uh, um, first let me welcome you and introduce you. Uh, this is Brother Jackson. His channel is Mecha Wing Zero. He also has a second channel called Osas Arminian. So I hope you'll subscribe to his channels. Uh, you'll find it very interesting. I, uh, if you heard m what I said about the word Lucifer, were you surprised, uh, or do, and do you agree or disagree with with what I said? Um, I wasn't surprised because I always thought that Lucifer was his name before the before he fell and everything. I always thought. Um, well, not that I've studied it much or whatever, but I always heard and thought that that was his name before the fall because he was an angel of light. Yeah. Uh, well, it translates to the light bearer or light bringer. That's what it literally translates to the name. Uh, but uh, first, let me ask you: Were you surprised that the 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 word or the name Lucifer appears only one time in the Bible? Um, I am surprised a little bit that it's only once, but not too surprised that it's not not um, not mentioned ma many times because we know that 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 Satan is not a light bearer anymore, and um, maybe God foresaw that the that the cat in Cinderella would be called Lucifer in the Disney movie, and he didn't want people to be confused. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> All right. The mice call him Lucifer because they can't quite pronounce his name. <laughs> yeah, that makes me also wonder about just the name Lucy. You know, when you call a girl's name Lucy, right? I wonder if that is, uh, you know, taken from the word Lucifer. I don't know. Um, but what do you think? You know, when it appears in this one time in the scriptures, uh, that's uh, Isaiah. Uh, 1412. I'm going to read it again and tell me if you if you have any uh, interesting insights on this because from what I'm seeing in the commentaries it's it's totally different than I anticipated. He says, "How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations?" Now in the commentaries it says it's referring to the king of Babylon and his fall. And uh, it, not, it does not refer to the, the fall of the devil. Uh, but uh, what is your take on that? You, let me paste the verse in here. Just if, I don't know if you have. Do you have it in front of you? Um, I'm looking it up. What is the reference again? It's uh, Isaiah 14:12. I'm going to paste it into the, sure. the uh, section there. Okay. Now I can see how your viewpoint uh, of, 
that you expressed about Lucifer uh, and this applying to him before the fall, I can see how this verse could be construed as that, but um, the, the commentators don't take it that way. I think maybe in context uh, it's hard to come to that conclusion, but taken by itself, what we know about the fall, uh, then uh, maybe, uh, maybe this does apply the way you said. Well, to be honest with you, without I don't want to give a definitive answer until I've read the whole chapter of Isaiah 14. But I will say this. It is kind of strange to me to call a human king light bearer. Yeah. Uh, well, I've heard people actually say that the that Lucifer is not the devil, but Lucifer is is a name for Jesus also. But I don't. Yeah, that's actually it's kind of interesting. This is one of the big KJV only controversies. If you and you should you should probably know that because you once held that position. Because like the NIV says, how how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of dawn, and Jesus is called morning star in the King James in some places. So that that's actually something that's controversial. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of the reasons that that uh, the KJV only is, uh, you know, hold on to that position because of that verse. Um, you know, they they say that if you're not KJV only, you're you're turning uh, Jesus into Lucifer. So um, I'm going to, since it apply, uh, it it uh, occurs only one time. Uh, I'm not going to. You know, spend much time talking about it. I don't claim to really be able to understand it, and I was actually quite surprised when uh, I learned about the uh, um, that particular verse and and the commentators or Bible dictionaries uh, take on it. It was quite a surprise to me. So uh, I don't claim to have any special insights on that. Uh, but the other words that we're going to be discussing that pertain to um, the devil is, of course, that we look up the words where the devil is named, I mean, called the devil. Another name for him is Satan. Uh, I've got all those verses. And then another one is um, uh, serpent. The very first time that we see it, if we look, we go from Genesis 1 through, the first reference to him is uh, Satan and then the, the serpent. Yeah. So, uh, if you think of other words that, that apply to this study, then then let me know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think s devil, Satan, and serpent are the ones that I found that, and I, I also looked up Lucifer and was, as I said, quite surprised that uh, uh, it it was uh, only one case. Mm -hmm. That was really amazing to me. Yeah, and one other place isn't he also called the Roaring Lion? Um, yeah, there, there's probably, but if he says he's the Roaring Lion, it will say Satan is the Roaring Lion, his name, right? Well, here's what it's, here's the verse I was referring to, I just typed it into Google. It says, it's, it's 1 Peter 5.8, which says, uh, in the King James, hold on, let me just scroll down to what the, what the KJV says, um, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is the devil. So, sorry, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. So that's one of the verses that uh, when you just search the word devil, mm -hmm. that verse will show up in the study. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's, he's called... Uh, like a roaring lion is a description of him, but he's actually called in that verse the devil. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we'll think of uh, other words that will be uh, you know helpful in this study. But uh, um, what I'd like to do is try to find the the first reference. I'm I'm on my wife's computer and um, she doesn't have Word. I'm using a notebook for my notes, and it's really a lot more difficult to. You know, notepad. Yeah, notepad, and it's really a lot more difficult. So uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, very very little formatting there. 
Yeah. There's... Notepad is good for writing computer programs and code. I wouldn't like it very much for my documents, though. Yeah, I'm trying to find the ones in uh, Genesis, uh, starting in, in um, um, going in chronological. I don't know if we can call it chronological order, but the order of the verses that appear in the scripture. What's the what's the term for that? Chronological order. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one would be in Genesis. Let me see. Here, here's a question about the King of Babylon view, by the way, going back to that for just a second. Okay. Who is it in this view that's saying, I will ascend above the clouds, above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High in Isaiah 14, 14? Would that be the King of Babylon saying that? Well, uh Isaiah fourteen fourteen. That's right after fourteen twelve. So they go together. Could you read them both in context, the whole thing? Sure. I'll I'll, I'll start at verse. Um, I'll start at verse twelve. Let me just go back one one two, and then I'll I'll, I'll read thirteen and fourteen after that. Okay. Uh -huh. First, the 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 thing that you said right here about the king of the Babylon possibly talking. It says, "How, whoops. Okay. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer?" Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Okay, now we're going to go on to 13 real quick, quickly. And verse 13 says, hold on, waiting for the page. It's th Verse 13 says, trying to stick with the same translation. It gives, okay, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Then it says in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Mm -hmm. That seems kind of strange for a human king to say that, all, is all I'm going to say. Not yeah. that I... Not that I'm definitely disagreeing with that view. I'd have to read the whole chapter, but yeah. Well, let's look up Isaiah chapter 14 period here, mm -hmm. and uh, let's, we'll look at it in the KJV so nobody gets mad at us. Yeah. 14, 12. Well, 12. Of course, Brain Audi would get mad at us. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna make someone mad, no matter what translation. Yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't hate the KJV. She no, no, she doesn't. She doesn't like, but she wouldn't like that we're trying to not offend KJV yeah, only. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It just, to me, it doesn't make sense what these uh, Bible dictionaries are saying about uh, that, that one occurrence of Lucifer. Uh, because as you pointed out here, in context, when we look at verses 12 through through. Uh, and then 15, it says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Uh, it certainly seems, and I think that these verses here are kind of foundational to uh, the concept that we have about uh, the fall of Lucifer and his, his desire to uh, you know, um, ascend and, and rebel against God and, and uh, you know, be God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm not convinced. I don't. I'd like to see how they come to that conclusion, but I don't. I don't see anything uh, in the commentaries that really are uh, that much of an explanation. Yeah, you know what I'm going to do, just to, just out of curiosity, I'm going to quickly go get my Ryrie Study Bible and see what the notes say about this. Hold on. Okay. Okay. So. Lucifer. 
Uh, I'm going to wait till Jackson gets back, and we'll also look at. We have uh, Matthew Henry's concise commentary. We got pulpit commentary, Gill's exposition of the entire Bible. Let's just see what they they say about it. And, um, according to the Bible dictionaries that I cited earlier, it doesn't make sense to me. I got the, the book, but I know I need to just turn to Isaiah real quick. Okay. I also looked up uh, these commentaries. Uh, I was re I referenced earlier some Bible dictionaries, and they really are not as thorough as a commentary. So I've got several commentaries here we can examine, too. But first, let's see what Ryrie says about it. Mm -hmm. Turning to Isaiah. Hold on. Right, almost there. All right. It says that um, it says about okay about fourteen twelve. Lucifer, literally the bright one, evidently a reference to Satan embodied in the king of Babylon because Christ's because of Christ's similar description, and because of the inappropriateness of the expectations of verses 13 and 14 on the lips of any but Satan. Hmm. He goes on to say in, in 13 and 14, five phrases beginning with I will detail Satan's sin. He wished to occupy heaven, the abode of God himself, to exalt his throne above the stars of God, may refer to his desire to rule all the angelic creatures, or it may be another way to indicate his self-exaltation north in he in sorry in in heathen literature indicated the abode of the gods. Thus, Satan was ambitious to govern the universe as the council of Babylonian gods supposedly did. He wanted to glory that be he wanted the glory excuse me that belonged to God alone. And his entire goal was to be like the Most High. That's what Ryrie says about this. Okay. Well, that's not. Uh, uh, so he still thinks it's the common. It's uh, the King of Babylon, at, who's kind of a picture of Satan in this case. Yeah, that's that's what I get out of his notes here. But he did say this. He said he said that. Um, because of Christ, he said. That he said, uh, evidently, it's a reference to Satan embodied in the King of Babylon because of Christ's similar description, and because of the inappropriateness of the expressions of verses 13 and 14 on the lips of any but Satan. So he kind of seems to be saying it's both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can see here that there are some uh, uh, verses that have this term: "How art thou fallen." And I think that people will come to that con the conclusion that uh, this is referencing S Satan's fall uh, uh, because the terminology is very similar that we find in some of these other locations. So let's look at those. Uh, first, we'll look at Isaiah 13:10, and uh, it says, uh, uh, "For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof." shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Is that uh, 1310? Yeah. Um, nine. It's 14. Um, it's Isaiah 14. But yeah, well, that's... Uh, 
that didn't work. Uh, let me see. This says Isaiah 13, 10. For the, four, the stars of heaven, the constellation thereof shall not. Okay. Uh, I guess in context, well, let's look at verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. Uh, well, I don't really find that, that verse uh, too helpful for what we're trying to do here. Uh, let's look at Isaiah 34, 4 and see what that's telling us. Uh, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as the fa fig, falling fig from the fig tree. Um, Well, these verses are certainly uh, are prophetic, I think, sound, uh, talking about end times. Um, I'm just not seeing how the what the connection is to the 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 trouble the problem verse that has Lucifer in it. Um, okay, let's look at Luke 10:18. That one I think might be helpful. Um, and he said unto them, I behold Satan as lightning fallen from heaven, fall from heaven. Uh, in context, it says in verse 17, starting verse 17, the 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. So here is Jesus saying, uh, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So you can see that that statement by Jesus not only tells us uh, of his uh, pre-existence before the incarnation, but his... Uh, the, the fact that uh, Satan had made this fall from heaven, he fell, and and uh, that I think that does go along with what this uh, Lucifer verse is telling us. Do you see the the connection there? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is Isaiah fourteen twelve through fifteen. Uh, I'm not getting what the uh, the commentators are necessarily getting out of it. Let me read Matthew Henry's uh, commentary on, on this. Uh, basically, it's chapter 14. And tell me, and just stop me anytime. If you, I say something that you think is uh, you need to um, talk about. The whole plan of divine providence is arranged with a view to the good of the people of God. A settlement in the land of promise is of God's mercy. Let the church receive those whom God receives. God's people, wherever their lot is cast, should endeavor to recommend religion by a right and winning conversation. Those that would not be reconciled to them should be humbled by them. This may be applied to the success of the gospel when those were brought to obey it who had opposed it. God himself undertakes to work a blessed change. They shall have rest from their sorrow and fear, the sense of their present burdens, and the dread of worse. Babylon abounded in riches. The king of Babylon, having the absolute command of so much wealth, by the help of it ruled the nations. This refers especially to the people of the Jews, and it filled up the measure of the king of Babylon's sins. Tyrants sacrificed their true interest to their lusts and passions, it is gracious ambition to covet to be like the Most High, for he has said, 
be ye holy, for I am holy, but it is sinful ambition to aim to be like the Most High. For he has said, he who exalts himself shall be abased. The devil thus drew our first parents to sin. Utter ruin should be brought upon him. Those that will not cease to sin, God will make to cease. He should, he should be slain and go down to the grave. This is the common fate of tyrants. True glory... Uh, that is, true grace will go up with the soul to heaven, but vain pomp will go down to the body, uh, uh, to the grave. Uh, there is an end of it. Uh, it goes on, but I, I think that's the, the reference really to, to Babylon and the king and, and, and uh, the connection. Kind of is, is, I think he's taking it as a, uh, as we t said earlier, a picture uh, that we could we can compare the king of Babylon to uh, to Satan and, and because of his arrogance of wanting to uh, uh, be like be like God and I, I guess according to this commentary the the king of Babylon I don't know if there's other verses to support it but the king of Babylon apparently had the same kind of an attitude yeah I, I wonder if it's not mutually exclusive which one it's talking about what do you mean Meaning it's about both the king of Babylon and Satan. Oh, okay. It's not mutually exclusive. So you, you, you kind of use like a double negative and that confused me or something. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so you, you think it is not mutually exclusive. It could be talking about both. Right. That's what I'm saying. It could be at this point. Yeah. Okay. Well... Um, I don't know what else to say about it, but uh, there certainly are other verses that we could reference. That well, let's look at. Uh, let's look at. Um, uh, you got Second Peter two four. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Uh, Revelation 12, 7 through 10. Uh, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. That's another name for, for Satan besides the serpent we'll have to consider. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Uh, so I, I think this is taking the verses that pertain to the fall, to Satan's arrogance and his and his uh, trying to rise, uh, you know, to be God. And uh, is there a part in the scriptures that really tells that story completely, or because it looks like I'm jumping all over the place? Uh, we looked at uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Luke, Peter, Second Peter, Revelation to get this story about the fall of Satan. See, I don't I don't think I could be wrong. If some if I am, someone show me where it tells a complete story, but I don't think there is. I think all all, all the we can do know about the fall is in little bits and pieces throughout the Bible. It seems that that's true and it's actually uh, I never really thought about that before, but the 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 story that we understand and I think you and I agree on this of what happened, or uh, the, the way that we've learned it and, and understand it and believe it, is has been pieced together like a puzzle. It's it's not just like one uh, you know chapter that or two. And that, by the way, this is why I think I think this is why there's some disagreement about when exactly this fall happened. For example. Some some people believe in for the audience in case they, they haven't heard of it called, this thing called the gap theory that 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 um, Genesis one two when it says that the earth was formless and and void that 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 was because Satan in the fall had had rebelled before before um, the creation account in in Genesis one the rest of the chapter and so that that's a that's a recreation because the earth has been ruined because of Satan's fall. Others, others are um, do not believe in a gap, 
but still maintain that the angels in heaven had rebelled before the creation in Genesis 1 and their response in Exodus when it says that in six days he created um, the heavens and the earth and all that's in them, it says in Genesis 20.11, they say that the heavens and the earth refers to like outer space and the planet earth and everything and therefore they don't think that that's when the angels came about. Others yet think it had to be during the six days of creation because he had to rebel in time to become the serpent to tempt Eve and everything. So there's a lot of different views on this. Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard those views, and that's why I personally, I don't feel confident in in uh, any of them as far as uh, really saying I really, really know the exactly uh, you know how this all played out or will play out because uh, another I don't know if you I don't think you mentioned this but. But there's also a school of thought where uh, this follows a future a future event where Satan still has access to God even today, and uh, and yet you know this is a forecast of a future fall uh, where the angels have fallen, uh, but uh, Satan is not banned from heaven and he's uh, he's still there accusing, and uh, and there will be a some of the verses that we see the fall of Satan are futuristic. Have you ever heard that? I don't think I have heard of that view before, but it doesn't surprise me that some would hold to that. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, well, since neither you or I uh, feel uh, competent to uh, really lay out a, um, a uh, explanation of this word Lucifer and, and then how it all relates to the fall and if it is talking about Satan or if it is to, it seems like it couldn't be talking only about a mortal man who's a king of a country uh, as, you, as you pointed out it seems to be talking about something much more than that so uh, and when you when you connect that to all the other verses that we've cited some of them uh, it, it, we kind of put a puzzle together and get the, get a picture, but it's to me it's it's not a real clear picture. I, I know, as I said, I've read uh, Ruckman's book on on uh, Genesis and, and Re Revelation, and much of that is explained in his books. And I've read Clarence Larkin's book, Dispensational Truth, where he he kind of maps it all out chronologically with charts, and I've seen his viewpoint on it. It's just that. I personally am not really confident in, in feeling like I really understand it. All right, brother. Unless you want to say anything else about Lucifer, uh, let's uh, let's move on to other words that uh, are commonly known for. I guess we got Satan, we got serpent, we got uh, the devil. Which let's let's go next to uh, the word um, Satan. Okay. Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna be pretty lengthy, I think, and we'll just go through all the verses that mention Satan and see if any of them are uh, what we can learn about him. Uh, first one I'm seeing here is, and I don't know why, it. Uh, I'm using right now uh, Bible Hub, and I don't know why they appear in a particular order. Uh, I'd like to go through it in... Uh, as I said, chronological order, but I, I rather than that try to struggle to put it in order, I think I'll just go through it as they appear here on this. Mark 3.23, and it says, um, And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? Uh, let's look at that in, in context, uh, that's starting with verse 22, so this is Mark 3, 22 through 24. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Hmm. Well, yeah, 
we also know from Matthew chapter seven that not everyone who claims to be casting out demons is is um, a legitimate Christian. Yeah, your audio got real faint there. Did you move far, too far away? No, it's that there's a train in the background right now. You've got a train nearby your house? Yes. How do you like that? It, I like it quite a bit. Yeah, it seemed like it actually would be uh, interesting and kind of like, you know, comforting. Uh, um, I've never lived right next to a train track where, you know, you hear the train going by and stuff, but uh, I used to work on the railroad. My dad worked as much of his life and retired from working on the railroad. And once I jumped on a freight train, uh, and when I was in college, two of, two of my buddies and I, we, we jumped a freight train from Las Vegas, like like hobos, you know. We rode a freight train to, to, to L.A. <laughs> but I like the sound of a train rolling by and the sound of the, you know, when it, it pulls its, blows its horn. One of your frat brothers, or? Uh, no, well, yeah, one of them was a fraternity brother, but he actually went back way way before the fraternity. He was goes back to junior in high school, and the other one is someone I just met in college. But it was a lot of it was a lot of fun trip. You know, if you've never jumped a freight train, <laughs> I'm not really I don't want to recommend it necessarily, but that was an interesting experience. Um, so this particular verse we're talking about now. Uh, uh, how can Satan cast out Satan? Jesus is referencing Satan in this case, uh, defending himself from uh, the accusation. And what is Jesus being accused of by these uh, scribes and Pharisees? It says in verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, quote, he is possessed by Beelzebub, unquote. There's another word. Beelzebub is, is not another name for, for the devil. And he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. So they consider Beelzebub the ruler of the demons. Uh, and then Jesus says, how can Satan cast out Satan? So here we're seeing that uh, Satan is the ruler of the demons. And that uh, he's sometimes called Beelzebub. Let's look up Beelzebub and see where that takes us, huh? Mm-hmm. Let's see. Uh, let me see. It occurs seven times. Isn't that interesting? Beelzebub occurs seven times, and Lucifer appears only once. <laughs> that is amazing. Wow. I never would have guessed that. I would have thought it would be re reversed, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, so we cited already uh, uh, you know, Mark 3.22, so here's another example, Matthew 12.24 of Beelzebub. But when, the, uh, it, but, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Uh, this is a this is leading up to a very important uh, uh, one of the most most important issues uh, in Christianity. And do, do you know what I'm thinking of right now? The the charismatic movement. I'm I'm thinking of the uh, unpardonable sin. Mm -hmm. I mean that's really what this is all about, isn't it? Right. Um, because this reaches, they're, they're accusing Jesus uh, uh, of performing miracles not through the power of God. They're saying it's not God that's working through you to do these miracles. It's Beelzebub. It's the devil, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And and so Jesus first says uh, Satan cannot cast out Satan. You know. And so it can't be Satan in me working out to cast out, you know, demons. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he goes on to say, uh, we could probably find it, I'll, I'll just paraphrase it, but he, he talks about how they are uh, committing an un unforgivable sin. It's uh, because he says, if you want to uh, 
call me names is one thing, but when you call the Holy Spirit the devil, that's that's the, you're, you're saying that the Holy Spirit is the devil, that, and uh, that's that's blasphemy. What do you think of the unpardonable sin in that context, uh, and and the the worry people have today of committing this unpardonable sin? Well, I think that if, I I don't think it's technically even possible to commit this sin anymore because these Pharisees um, saw Jesus right close up and saw what he was doing and was right there and had the Holy Spirit right in front of their face, but they rejected him and called it Beelzebub or the devil or whatever. And they um, and, and, and therefore they kind of set in stone their rejection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think this is, uh, I, I agree, and that there, but, but there are a lot of people that are afraid that they might commit the unpardonable sin, or and there, there's actually a challenge. The, they call it the blasphemy challenge. They're challenging people to, hey, come forward and commit the unpardonable sin, and they think it's real funny, you know. That uh, and uh, yeah, I've heard I, of that. I agree with you. I don't think it is possible because I think this is a unique situation, and it can only happen at one point in time, because uh, it. Uh, several things have to be present. One, you have to have Jesus present, and we don't have Jesus present right now. We have the Holy Spirit. You have to have Jesus performing miracles right in front of you, and and uh, I haven't seen him perform miracles, and and then you you have to then accuse him of of say, of not performing the miracles through the power of God, but but the devil's working through him, and and I'm not able to do that. Can you do that? Nope. Uh, so I, I agree with you. I just think it's impossible to do it. But there is another take on this unpar unpardonable sin, and and do uh, you know the? It's a very very common viewpoint of it. Uh, you know what I'm thinking of? What I, what are you thinking of specifically? The the fact that the unpardonable sin is is not what we just described, a particular event in in history, but it is uh, any person who rejects the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus, it's unpardonable. In other words, the sin of unbelief. If mm -hmm. you in Jesus, well, I, I understand that point of view, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it really fits because let's say someone's an unbeliever for like thirty years. We'll just say they're an atheist for thirty years. And then they put their faith in Jesus. Are they not forgiven for their unbelief before that time? Yeah, yeah. The only way it would apply is if if they continued in unbelief until their death, mm -hmm. and and then, of course then it's unpardonable. And, and I, you and I agree. The the reason people go to to hell is not because uh, of their sins. Uh, the sin issue is is already uh, uh, settled. You know, I, I believe everybody's sins are already forgiven. And you you believe that everybody's sins are potentially forgiven? Uh, that, right. that anybody who chooses to put their faith in Jesus at that moment, their sins are all forgiven. Uh huh. So, uh, so sin is not the reason people are going to hell. It's uh, uh, just not believing in Jesus and receiving eternal life. Uh, so uh, it couldn't be that uh, the the unpardonable sin is in, in context when we when we look at. Mm -hmm. Jesus refers to it as the unpardonable sin. Uh, what he's thinking of at that time doesn't apply to what we just how we just explained it here. Right, right. The, the blasphemy challenge thing that you mentioned too, by the way, a lot of those people are making these videos saying, "I deny the Holy Spirit," and that's not the unpardonable sin. I even, you know, I'll even go so far as to think I think somebody. Even if somebody thinks right now that Jesus um, cast out or did miracles in the name of uh, it, it, uh, cast out miracles because of Satan's power, even that I don't think technically qualifies as the unpardonable sin because they haven't seen Jesus up close like that and everything. Like it seems to me like someone could still repent of that belief and believe in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Okay, um, I, I think we're really much quite a bit in agreement on that, and uh, 
you know, you and I don't agree on everything. Probably we do agree on 90 to 95 percent of theology, but uh, uh, I think the, the the general population there's a wide variety of opinions on this subject. Let's go to uh, right. more verses on uh, on Beelzebub. Uh, uh, well, let me see. Several of these are, are, are citing the exact same event. Uh, some of them, I, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and then you got, they're all, uh, every one of these is, uh, I mean, it's enough for students to be like their teachers. Okay, here's one that might be a different. Uh, oh, there's one more thing I want to say about the unpardonable sin. All right. Anyone out there who's worried they've committed it, I don't believe has committed it, even if our view that it's no longer committable isn't true, because the, their, the Pharisees' hearts were so hardened they didn't care that they, that they had committed it or whatever. So anyone out there who's watching this can stop worrying that they've done that. Yeah. Uh, I think that same uh, principle philosophy really could be applied to, to just uh, salvation too if someone's worried about losing their salvation I'm uh, losing it well you know they, they, the, the fact that they're concerned afraid of that should tell them look I did believe in Jesus I did believe in Jesus I did what I was told to do I'm afraid I, I, I might lose it but but uh, then the fact that they're worried about it tells me that they sincerely did believe in him and well, they they're, they're, unless, unless they believed a false gospel, what's that? Unless they believed a false gospel, like that they if they sin they lose their salvation or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't think people normally uh, come to Jesus for salvation. You know, however you want to phrase that. Uh, yeah. Describe it. They, they don't normally do that based mm -hmm. upon that kind of a, a premise. That I, I mean, what person witnesses someone and says? says that uh, right from the beginning that okay you need to uh, believe in Jesus and they give them the list of things whatever they think is you've got to believe about Jesus you know he's, well, some uh, some campus evangelists do that they actually say that uh, hey I, and I want you to know that when you put your faith in Jesus that you, you're not going to keep it you keep your salvation unless you do X Y and Z yeah I actually there's a guy who comes to my a, a street preacher that comes to my college campus every Friday who basically says that? Wow, that's uh, well, I'm not completely surprised, but I I do think that uh, it's probably a minority, tiny, yeah, tiny tiny minority of people that would actually include that in their gospel message. But they'll, they'll they might tell them a real gospel message, uh, maybe mess it up by you know re you repent of your sins and something mm -hmm. like that, but. Then, but they don't usually include saying, and 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 you know, if you put your faith in Jesus, you've got to be careful because if you get out of line, you know, you're going to lose your salvation. You're yeah. How how this evangelist says it is, he says, you you have to be careful not to commit a sin unto death, which he takes as a as a sin that causes you to lose your salvation, like drunkenness, pornography, or something like that. Wow. He's a, is he just a university preacher or a street preacher too, or do you know his name? I, his name is Matt. His first name. Um, he's local to to the area. He comes down from Cheyenne every Friday. I heard him say. Yeah, that's so. very unfortunate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, well, now we're going to look at. Uh, there are seven references to Beelzebub, and they all look to me like they're talking about the same event, so no need to repeat it over and over. But this one in Matthew 10.25, I think, is a different event. Here it says, I'll start with verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Okay. So this is the uh, the only other reference to Beelzebub that is uh, uh, unique from the others, and uh, we know that he's referring to uh, this 
this event. You know, he was accused of being a Beelzebub or having Beelzebub in him work do, work these miracles through him. So now Jesus is saying, look, if if they called me, you, you're my disciples. So imagine if if they were willing to call me Beelzebub, the, the devil. Then how much more will they malign you? You're you're my disciples. I mean, you're going you, you better expect it too. Mm -hmm. I tell you, uh, I've I've experienced it. You know, I'm sure that uh, you, you you've experienced uh, some kind of uh, persecution. The only people, the only Christians. Let me call them Christians instead of Christians. Uh, the only Christians that uh, don't receive some kind of persecution, whether it's just mocking and just, oh, come on, you don't really believe that, do you? That's just a, uh, mm -hmm. you might as well believe in the Easter Bunny, you know, you believe in the Bible and Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's that subtle, it's mm -hmm. a form of mocking and, you know, in, insulting you. Uh, or it could be much, to a much higher degree, uh, where it can, gets to be even a more vicious attack. Mm -hmm. and sometimes even physical attack, and now, and now we, we, we see around the world what's happening to, mm -hmm. to Christians that are being martyred by being burned alive and and, mm -hmm. and, and beheaded by this uh, Muslim, crazy Muslims that uh, mm -hmm. in the Middle East. So there's varying degrees of persecution, and Jesus is telling us here, uh, look, if they're willing to call me the devil, you know, what do you think they're going to be doing to you? Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we've exhausted the term Beelzebub. So let's go on now and uh, let's go back to Satan. And uh, let's go to, here's a, one that is interesting. It's in Zechariah, Zechariah 3.2. Are you, are you using uh, your, uh, your Bible or some kind of a, Computer program to follow along with me. Bible Hub, and then I've got a Bible here, physical yeah. Bible here too. Yeah, I'm using I'm using Bible Hub, and it's I just put in Satan and uh, Mark three twenty three. We discuss. I'm looking at Zechariah three two, mm -hmm. and uh, it says, um, "And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan." Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke, rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So, Zechariah. I'll read it more in context. Uh, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the light uh, of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. Take away your garments, and I will put fine your. Well, I don't quite understand what's going on here at this point. Let me look at it. Three, two. Uh, I'm going to look at it in the in the evil uh, NLT. <laughs> Three, two. Because uh, sometimes the, the NLT, stands, it's, it's, it, NLT stands for New Lucifer's translate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we're looking at, right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read the same section in the NLT and just maybe we'll get an insight. So then the angel showed me, and in this case it says Jeshua instead of Joshua. And we know that Joshua, Jeshua, Yeshua, uh, it all really is a name, uh, Jesus. Just different ways of, of spelling it. And uh, it's just like you can spell John, J O N or J O H N or, you know, you know, in various ways. Uh, so then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. 
the accuser Satan was there at the angel's right hand making accusations against Joshua and the Lord said to Satan I the Lord reject your accusation Satan yes the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you this man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel so the angel said to the others standing there take off the, his filthy clothes and turning to Joshua he said see I have taken away your sins and now I am giving you these fine new clothes wow that's really amazing that's Zechariah wow mm -hmm. I mean how many times have you read Zechariah I don't think I have read it to be honest no don't tell me that I mean it's been years and years I should say I haven't read don't it tell me, no. don't tell me that there's there's a part of the Bible you haven't read Oh, there is. But wow. the thing is, this isn't it, because we did go over this in Sunday school years ago when I was a kid, but I don't think I've read it in my adult life. Huh. Well, I find it interesting that, uh, first of all, in the NLT, uh, the spelling is J-E-S-H-U-A. And uh, a lot of people like to call Jesus uh, Y. E S H U A Yeshua, or various spellings of that, but uh, Joshua, Jeshua, Yeshua, and Jesus are all interchangeable. They're it's the same name. So Joshua is a name for Jesus too, not related to the Joshua, the, the book of Joshua. Yeah. yeah, but I'm trying to understand if if this verse is actually talking about Joshua, the uh, um, and the, you know the character in the Bible, right? Uh, you know Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, and he was yes. the, he was like the right hand man for for Moses, if I recall right. Yep. And then uh, was it talking about this person? It was, he says jo jo Joshua, the high priest. I don't think Joshua Joshua was was a priest, was he? I don't know if he was a Levite or not. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure he was not. Let me let me Google that real quick. Yeah. Okay. Because if 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 he was not, then this has to be referring to Jesus. Then the angel showed me Jesus, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser Satan was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Jesus. If if I'm if it's, if this. Uh, fits and the Lord said to Satan I the Lord reject your accusation Satan yes the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you this man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire and Jesus's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel so the angel said to the others standing there take off his filthy clothes and turning to Jesus he said see I have taken away your sins and now I'm giving the you these fine new clothes now it wouldn't fit being Jesus because because it's uh yes it, okay okay so according to what I found it's not Jesus but it is a different Joshua than the one um who 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 assisted Moses it looks like oh okay yeah it's a different Joshua than that definitely okay um but the important thing here is uh to if, since we are studying Satan is that it says the Lord said to Satan I the Lord reject your accusation Satan and and the ver first verse it says the angel showed me Jeshua or Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord the accuser Satan was there at the angel's right hand making accusations against Joshua uh, so here we see that Satan uh, is an example of what well, you know we commonly understand that he is the accuser He's like the, the prosecuting attorney in the courtroom, and Jesus is the defense attorney. And uh, so in this case, he's accusing, and uh, the Lord says to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusation, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Then Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the other standing there, take off his filthy clothes. 
And turning to Joshua, he said, See, I have taken away your sins, and now I'm giving you these fine new clothes. It's a... Uh, so it's a picture of salvation, is what you're saying. Yeah, that's what it is. It seems pretty obvious that uh, that's one of the one of the beautiful things about all of the scriptures is that uh, uh, trying to understand when we're to take a story literally. I mean, did this is is this something that historically happened? I I would think so, but. Uh, I, I and so there was a real person named Joshua who was a high priest, and Satan was accusing him, and and, and God, God rebuked Satan, and uh, gave him and and said, "Change your clothes to these clean clothes, which is symbolic of of taking away sins and putting on righteousness." Yeah, that's what that's that's. I mean, obviously, I haven't put in enough enough study and compared all the various views on this passage to definitively say that, but that's the way I lean. Yeah. Okay. So here we have a picture of two, two important things. One is Satan being the accuser, and the other thing, of course, salvation is uh, our sins are taken away, and we're given clean garments which symbolize that in exchange uh, what happens in salvation is our sins are taken away and they're, they've been placed upon Jesus and then righteousness is put on our new garments put on us which is the righteousness of Jesus this is the imputation or the transaction that takes place mm -hmm. okay um, so now let's go to uh, How about Job? This ought to be interesting. Job one twelve. <laughs> Boy, Job. Yeah. Now you you've read Job, I'm sure, at least once or twice, haven't right. you? Right. Yeah. I mean, Job. What a what a story. That that's yeah. it. here. Let me ask you about Job before we even go into this verse. My my question is: Have you ever thought uh, about why uh, God would permit? Uh, Satan to do these horrible things to Job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what's kind of interesting is in religious debating with people at my university, um, one of the one of the main objections by atheists and why God is is evil or whatever they talk about the Book of Job. Hmm. Because he allowed Satan to do bad things to him. Yeah. Well, I, I have an opinion, and I'm going to reserve the opinion until until I, I get a, an idea. If you if you've given this much thought, I've given a lot of thought because um, because it is it, it appears to be a big problem, and that's why the atheists want to throw that in our face. So I've given a lot of thought, and I have an opinion as to why this all happened, and 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 uh, you know why God would would permit it and kind of endorse it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any opinion or have you come to I any... have a few thoughts, but I, I probably haven't thought about it as much as you have. What is, what is your thought? What is your thought on it? Because yeah, you might well, be... Number, number one, I think that God probably very, very richly rewarded Job in heaven for, his, for, for, for this. So ultimately, I think Job is looking back, glad he going through it, as unpleasant as it was at the time. And also... To give an example for, for everyone else when bad things are going to happen in our lives and everything and what we can expect. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm, I think your, your second point, well, but both points I think are, are true. But the second point is the, the primary reason. See, look, you and I right now are talking about Job and his experience. Mm -hmm. We're talking about it today, mm -hmm. and we uh, not only are, are learning as we read Job and study Job and mm -hmm. um, this this whole uh, trial that he went through. Uh, we're talking about it, and, mm -hmm. and 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 the people listening to us maybe they'll get inspired and want to read the book of Job, and and they're going to be thinking about this. So um, I think that. The reason God permitted it is so that in the future 
you and I would be talking about it right now, and other people would be talking about it and learning from this. The idea that uh, Job, mm -hmm. even though he was considered to be so good and God loved him so much, uh, even no matter how good we are, uh, we still are going to suffer in life, and we're still going to go through trials. And who can compare to Job? Like, you know, I complain, you know, and I, I was on my little, uh, you know, self-pity trip this last year because last year, 2014, was the most difficult year of my life. Uh, you know, I, I had three surgeries. I, I was in the hospital for 27 days altogether, and it, it, it's been six months and a day since my first surgery. And I had three different infections, and on and on and on complications, and and I am still still suffering from some of the uh, results of that experience. And yet, what my experience, as difficult as it was, it pales in comparison to Job. Job gives everybody perspective. It's like when I was getting out of the hospital for the last time. I'm in a wheelchair, and my wife's standing next to me. We're right outside of my hospital room in the hallway, and we're waiting for someone to come by and, and take us out of the hospital. And I see a woman uh, who's a doctor. She walked right into the room that was across from mine, and I could hear the, overhear the conversation. I couldn't see, but I could hear. And the doctor said to the, the patient, uh, did you find out... Do you know the, the results of the test? And the patient said, no, I, I, I don't know. And the doctor said, well, you've got cancer. And uh, you can get chemo or radiation, but considering your age, uh, you might not want to do it. I mean, and it was that matter of fact. It was like, it was just like, you know, uh, there, there was really no sympathy expressed in any way from the doctor. It was just very businesslike. And, 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 uh, I I looked at my wife and it just dawned on me. I mean, I really I actually uh, teared up. You're thinking, look, uh, look how, how I felt, everything I've gone through, and yet no one's come to my room and told me such a thing. And, and you know, there's always this example of the man who had no shoes, and and then he met the man who had no feet. Right. And Job gives us that perspective, and that's I believe this is why Job happened. This is why God permitted it and even endorsed it so that throughout history we could all have perspective and say, look, no matter how hard my difficult situation is, uh, you look at the, the patience of Job. Look how no matter what happened, Job still never lost his faith, never cursed God, uh, even though he was t antagonized even by his friends who were saying, you must have done something wrong. You know, this couldn't be happening to you and if you didn't do something like, just like these uh, these people today that are saying that if you're sick and you don't get healed or if you don't get blessed, your prayers are not being answered, there must be some kind of sin in your life. Otherwise, you know, or you don't have enough faith, God would answer your prayer, right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, that was what was happening to Job. He's not only suffering these horrible things with health and money and family and all these losses, and yet his friends are antagonizing him, and he's going through this, and then you and I read that story, and it gives us perspective to say, wait a second, how, why should I be upset when I, my problems pale in comparison to Job's? Mm -hmm. That's my theory, brother. That's yeah, yeah. You know, what, you know what else is interesting about the book of Job? Uh, in addition to all you said, which I agree with the whole thing, Really interestingly, slightly off topic, but still worth mentioning, I just heard a, a really good sermon by Dr. Tom Kakuza. He's a he's a, a, a free grace minister who had a real had really good videos. You can look him up called Understanding Repentance. But it was called this sermon was called The Scientific Accuracy of the Bible. And one of the things he talks about is how the book of Job is a book of incredible antiquity. Some even some people even think it's the very first 
book, that were the very er oldest book in existence today. Now that's disputed by historians, but whether that's true or not, knowing how, how what incredible antiquity that book has and all of the scientifically accurate things that God says to Job that no one writing at the time would have had any way of knowing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, very good point. And that, that's that's all true, and I know that... Uh, the I'm going to upload this sermon on my channel, by the way, so I recommend everyone check it out. Yeah, okay, I'll watch that. I'm familiar with him, him uh, too. Uh, I think it's a very good point, because there's much more in Job than just his trials and how he dealt with it. Uh, God talking about, who are you, Job? You know, can you create, can you create a universe? You know, come on. Uh, but... Uh, uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of things that we get from the book of Job, but to me, the the number one thing is uh, perspective, and uh, the idea that not only uh, do my hardships pale compared to Job's, uh, but uh, also uh, look how he dealt with it. I mean, you know, he he got upset, but he would never do what he, his wife told him to do: just curse God and die. Come on, Job, you're suffering so much. Why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> he wouldn't do it. Nope. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read Job 1.12. Uh, and it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth, from the presence of the Lord. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of references to uh, Satan uh, in the book of Job. And this is the first chapter, the 12th verse, we see the word Satan. So we see the beginnings of what, uh, what transpired here. Now, uh, I'm assuming, you know, you take this literally. I take it literally as a literal story, as a historical event. Right. A lot, a lot of people want to, you know, they allegorize a lot of things in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. I well, what I what I think some people don't realize is just because something literally happened doesn't mean that it can't be used as a parable in the sense of teaching us a lesson too. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you're right. As you said earlier, it's it's not mutually exclusive. You know, it can be a a true historical event. And yet, also something where we can derive uh, some uh, some great lesson out of it, and, uh, and it doesn't have to be allegorical. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then let's look at Job uh, two two. Um, it says, uh, "And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou?" And Satan answered the Lord and said from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And then this is where the Lord says, uh, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil, and he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him uh, to ruin him without cause. Right. So, in other words, Satan is really the one to blame, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's. Uh, let's look at this whole chapter here, uh, Job two. Uh, Job loses his health. Yeah. If you're anybody watching this now, if you've never read the book of Job, uh, I really recommend you read it. Another one that's a very neglected book is Ecclesiastes. Are you familiar with that much, brother? Yeah, that that that's basically um, Solomon's uh, uh, cynicism. Yeah, 
Well, his cynicism and then his conclusion that you know all is vanity, that uh, uh, you know uh, the, all of the wives, all of the concubines, vanity. You know, all, all of the horses, thousands of stallions, vanity. All of the gold and all the wealth, just vanity. And and he, he finally comes to the conclusion. I guess this is late in his life that all those things that uh, he thought were important and had meaning. Uh, he finally realized that that's really not what life is about, mm -hmm. and uh, the, of course, the life should be about our love and and, and the relationship with God. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I, I just think that uh, these are two books that there's a lot to get out of. That uh, mm -hmm. I, I find they're both kind of neglected. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's go now to. Uh, uh, we don't need to keep going through all the Job verses because we know the, the basic idea of what Satan continues to do in, in that. Let's look at Revelation 2.13. Uh, and it says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Hmm. But I have a few things against you, because you have there uh, some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who held... Of course, this is talking about the messages to the churches, and this is the church mm -hmm. in uh, Pergamum. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see Satan mentioned twice. Uh, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Sword mm says -hmm. this. Yeah, it's it's interesting of, of these seven churches how Jesus you know, like gives gives a critique to each of the churches, mm -hmm. and uh, and this one. Uh, it's. It doesn't sound like it's a very positive grade or, or, or rating he's given him. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just it, it really that that's really a, a a slap in the face to lordship salvation that this is a legitimate church and yet they're dwelling where Satan's throne is. Yeah. Yeah. And you hold fast my name. Uh, you know. It, they call themselves Christians, and yet they're right where Satan's throne is. Mm -hmm. I have a few things against you because you have, there are some who hold the teaching of Balaam, and who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols. So it, it's showing that there is there is a part of the congregation that is uh, really gotten off track, or that they're uh, mm -hmm. they're bringing in idol worship and, and uh, other gods, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, can we let's go to Second Thessalonians two nine? Uh, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Uh, in context, it says, uh, Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the uh, appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. This, uh, do you think this is a, you know, a, a, like a like a parallel verse to uh, Revelation and the, uh, the 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 man of sin, the 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 Antichrist? It it um. I would have to 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 say that I would have to you know 
do a little more careful study, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to just make statements without having really studied them, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and you're very much aware of this, that, uh, you know, I've helped the, uh, the uh, kind of the, the viewpoint of uh, Clarence Larkin and, and Ruckman and, and, and dispensationalism and the seven dispensations and the uh, the pre-tribulation rapture, uh, second coming in the millennial kingdom, all of that I've held to for out of 28 years, probably for 25 years, and then recently uh, I'm I'm not as confident in that, and and I'm now look at it, at uh, eschatology in a historical way as I, I see all these things playing out from the time of Stephen being the first martyr and then we see all the apostles and all the early church being martyred and all throughout history the Christians being martyred first by Jews and then by the, and the Romans and, and, and then by the Roman Catholic Church and then by the Muslims and, and even today uh, if Look what's happening in the Middle East. So uh, I, I think that these prophecies have been playing out throughout all of history, and that they will reach a climax, and uh, we will have uh, this second coming and the resurrection, and all that will happen. It could be happening very soon. But as here, this is Second Thessalonians that we're reading this. Uh, this is not Revelation, and yet this seems to be like a, a very related to uh, what you read in Revelation, yeah, calling it uh, the lawless one will be revealed whom yeah. the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Uh, so and that certainly sounds like a real uh, description that, that you see in, in also in Revelation uh, of, of this Antichrist. Yeah, I mean, as you know, regardless of what eschatology you take, there are some tough questions to answer. Yeah. It, it seems to me that a straightforward, literal reading of Revelation teaches premillennialism and, uh, and, and, and dispensational sort of Israel-centric end times, and that, that's why I think that's the viewpoint that makes the most sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's also look at, uh, I'm seeing that Revelation 13, 14 uh, is kind of a cousin verse to this. It says, because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So this is referencing the signs. Let's look at Revelation 13, 14 in context. Um, uh, he performed great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of the heaven to the earth in the presence of man. Uh, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs. Uh, and, and skip, I'm um, skipping a few verses, and it was given to him to give, uh, let me see, so that the image, all right, well this whole thing, verse, Revelation 13, uh, verses 13 through uh, 15, are kind of parallel verses to what we just talked about in uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 8 through 10, uh, referencing Satan, but the uh, it's not really really the subject is not Satan in this verse. The subject I think is the Antichrist. Hmm. Uh, Satan is it says the one whose coming is in accord mm -hmm. with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. So I think this is the Antichrist that has like uh, as Jesus did. Uh, the, his signs uh, through the, the power of the Holy Spirit working through him, uh, yeah. this Antichrist is doing the various signs and wonders with the, the, the power of Satan working through him. So apparently Satan does have the ability 
to do some miraculous things. Mm -hmm. Hmm. He does. Um, let's look at Second uh, Corinthians two eleven. lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Uh, in context, it says, But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right, what what can we learn from that about Satan and and uh, in, within the the body of Christ? Well, that we can learn about his schemes from the Bible if we're studying it and everything. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the, it seems to me in this in the context here, it's it's talking about let's say that you and I had some issue, and mm -hmm. Satan would love it. Satan would love to, you know, if, if there was some issue between us, he's going to do everything he can, not only to cause it, but to uh, stir it up and make it worse and make it a division. Yeah. And so what we need to do to defend against Satan's schemes is we need to forgive each other. Uh-huh. And that, and that way we don't give Satan any advantage by, by uh, causing a division within the body. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I wish. Uh, I, I tell you, I have, uh, mm -hmm. I have seen uh, seen some of this happening both ways, where uh, you know the, there's divisions and that they continue, and then I've I've seen divisions where uh, there is this forgiveness and this reconciliation, and and we don't let Satan get the victory, and that's uh, that's wonderful when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, yeah, sometimes, unfortunately, you're saying it's not been repaired, and other times, fortunately, it has. Yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, uh, I've had, you know, when I took on the, the um, did the series, started the series um, Q&A, mm -hmm. where I was willing to say, okay, just send me whatever question you have, and I'll, I'll uh -huh. attempt to answer it. When, when, as soon as you attempt to answer people's questions and you you publicly stating an opinion, now I, you know sometimes the answer I have is you know and rarely and this is the case, but sometimes I say, well, I just don't know. I mm -hmm. I either have no opinion or I have an opinion, but I'm not that confident in it. Mm -hmm. so oftentimes, uh, I'll answer someone's question, and uh, you know I have a pretty strong opinion about it. And unfortunately, uh, not everybody's going to agree with every opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, they don't, when they don't agree, then there's potential for a division. And that's that's, and I've I've seen it happen also with in the hangouts when mm -hmm. I did the thing ready with an answer. So um, that's the, the the issue is: can we publicly be free? to state our opinions, as we're doing right now, we're just looking at these scriptures, mm -hmm. you know, every scripture that has Satan in it, or Lucifer, or the mm -hmm. devil, and, and we're just talking about it, and, and we're expressing our opinions. It's, and some of it is real clear, mm -hmm. some of it's not, but, but we're, we dare to talk about it publicly, and we're leaving ourselves open to criticism, because whatever we say, mm -hmm. some people may agree, some people may disagree, but how... How will they react when they disagree? Mm -hmm. That's what that's what is unfortunate is that so many people, as soon as they disagree with some position you've taken, some interpretation you've taken, mm -hmm. then they uh, they make it into uh, a, a big deal instead of just a little deal. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope that uh, hope that we can all learn to. Uh, listen to each other when when you don't agree. Say, well, I don't agree. I find your opinion. You know who I find really interesting is uh, that that uh, is a good example of this is um, Brother Joe. Uh, 
uh, Joe Byron, uh, known as Sebastian Dresden now, you know, he has some really strange ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, his ideas about, you know, marriage and sex and heaven and, and other things in heaven and, and, the, and the creation and how Eve came out of Adam. I mean, if you've listened to some of his things, ideas, mm -hmm. they're bizarre. They're, mm -hmm. But does, does, because of his ideas are very unorthodox, Mm -hmm. How are you going to react to it? Are you are some people going to react and say, "Wow, that's crazy and heretical," you know, and, mm -hmm. and they shun him? And, and uh, yeah, for me, I just find it interesting. Yeah, I find it fascinating. If anybody has some new idea that a mm -hmm. new way of seeing something that I haven't considered before, I want to hear about it. But it, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I, I'll tell him I've actually told Josh, and I think that's crazy. But uh, mm -hmm. it's not. There's not any reason for me to want to, you know, say, "Hey." Right. Unfortunately, as as we as we find out, as we found out, it's not always a cut and line of what you tolerate and what you don't. Because remember, you really tried, and I commend you for trying, Luke, to tolerate the Calvinism as repulsive as that was to you and is to you now, even more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and then there's there's someone that is. Uh, uh, no longer associated with me because mm -hmm. because I was uh, and what he what he says is, is keeping a, a dirty little secret. In other words, I was aware of Mitch's Calvinism uh, mm -hmm. for a couple of years before it became a public issue, and, mm -hmm. and I and, and I knew about it, but I never told everybody else about it because I I, I always had a, a hope that you know in private. Mitch and I could talk those things out, and maybe uh, maybe I could convince him. And and he wasn't trying to teach it and, and, and push it down our throats publicly. So I I, I was just uh, you know being permissive of that. And mm -hmm. but there's one person that thinks I I was very deceptive because mm -hmm. I I didn't notify everybody. Well, once mm -hmm. Mitch decided to publicly come out and 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 start. Uh, proclaiming it and, and arguing for it, mm -hmm. I, I was left in a position where I had to, I had to take a stand against it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's that is an example of hey, mm -hmm. as we want to try to tolerate other opinions and even some mm -hmm. opinions that are are bad. If it's in private, you, you, if you have a hope that maybe you mm -hmm. can change their mind, mm -hmm. but once they come out publicly, it, it's the same kind of a thing with this study I just finished on. Uh, Hyper dispensationalism, Paul mm -hmm. only. I just completed that, and there are some people that didn't want to join me in the uh, in the, uh, the the fight against Paul onlyism because they right didn't, they didn't because want part to... of it is because they are brothers in Christ, and you did always acknowledge that. But yeah, yeah, uh, but they they felt that it was uh, you know would cause division, but what I felt was. That the Paulonians were already causing division because they were trying to force it on us. Yeah. Also, that they would, uh, um, I guess, uh, I found out that historically through, you know, what uh, I read from H.A. Ironside, that, mm -hmm. that this has been a, a problem now since the the 19, end of the 19th century, where yep. they have been causing problems in congregations by pushing this. This viewpoint on on the congregation and yep. stirring up trouble and causing divisions in the congregations over it. So so what I my reaction to it uh, has been uh, uh, typical. I mean, uh, a lot of people th for the last century have been reacting the same way. We stop trying to force this down our throats. It's obviously mm -hmm. some peculiar, weird ideas you've got. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I I know you're a brother, but but if you mm -hmm. keep on pushing it on us, just as remember Eve was trying to push on preterism on us at one point, yeah, yeah, uh, then, then you got to you got to say, wait a second, uh, what you're you're defaming Jesus and John and Peter and and mm -hmm. all the Old Testament apostles that I'm uh, I mean prophets who all were teaching us about about the Beth, death, burial, and resurrection. You're you're diminishing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So you know, when it comes to a point where uh, uh, I guess we got off on a wild tangent there, but uh, well, I don't even think it was—I don't think it was purely a tangent. We're explaining 
to the audience why there has been some divisions in spite of us not wanting them. Because that's what Satan wants, is to cause divisions. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what this verse is that we just cited here is talking about. How mm -hmm. We're told, look, forgive each other. Mm -hmm. don't, don't let these divisions go on, and, and, and you know, you, and, and because that's what Satan wants. Mm -hmm. Satan gets the victory when we when we have these divisions. So mm -hmm. let's nip it in the bud, and let's get along. But then there are some times where you know, you've got to take a stand. I mean, mm -hmm. if if a Paul Onlyus wanted to have fellowship with me, uh, I would welcome it. As, but they have to know what I how I see Paul Onlyism. And, mm -hmm. and, and give me the right to say it. Mm -hmm. And if they want to say that, uh, you know, uh, defend Paul onlyism, that, that's fine. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I can't keep, don't expect me to keep my mouth shut when you're, when you're defaming Jesus and, and, the, and the other apostles. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to just sit back and just, I did that. I actually did that for a couple of years. I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to, cause a division, but there comes a point where I, I said, no, wait a second, I, I, I have to speak up my mind on this, and uh, you know, if, if they decide that uh, even though I've been tolerant of them, mm -hmm. uh, if, by speaking my mind, will they be tolerant of me? Well, I found out they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, found out, you found that out pretty quickly, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Immediately, about a dozen of my closest friends on YouTube left. Mm -hmm. Once I decided to speak against Polonism, Paul so mm -hmm. you know, all the while that I and and and, and there, I know that there's a lot of brothers now that they're not Polonius, they're but they're secretly you know secretly against it, and they're tolerating it, and uh, that's that's their decision. They have to live with their their mm -hmm. decision. But, but for me, I I felt I came to a point where I I had to speak out against it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Uh, what's the next verse? And, and, and um, the, the other thing that Satan does with regard, regarding all these things is I, um, I think that, that Satan doesn't like, like when believers are united for the gospel. So that's why he tries to sometimes make people fight over other doctrines or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that verse we just discussed—that—that's—that's uh, mm -hmm. that's the whole point of the the verse is that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know when we when we argue, when Paul talks about uh, don't get in these uh, disputations. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, and he uses the example about food and holidays and, and things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, come on, uh, if you can't talk cordially about that. Mm -hmm. then, then, then don't talk about it or whatever, but, but, but you should not have dispute things and let it get out of hand over these minor things. Uh, but, but boy, I see, I see a lot of it. And uh, mm -hmm. let me see, what's the next verse? Uh, Smartest. I think it's... Uh, let's First Thessalonians uh, 2.18... I think this would probably be should be the last. I'm looking at the clock and it's almost three. Mm -hmm. so I, guess I don't like the shows to go more than two hours. So you, I, I want to talk to you after the show though, if you have time. But uh, let's make this the last verse here. Mm -hmm. First Thessalonians, two eighteen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. Uh, and in context, uh, verse 17, it says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager to, with great desire to see your face, for we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? So, uh, keeping this in context, talking about Satan, 
uh, you know, here we see that Paul says that Satan hindered them. Uh, hindered them getting together with a congregation, with, with people that he wanted to, to come go visit and, and, and have fellowship with, but Satan hindered them. Yeah. So it looks like uh, Paul is said stating that he believes that some of the troubles that he, he, he's had, like not being able to come and visit this congregation, was because of Satan working against him. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, 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 so Satan's very divisive, in other words. Yeah, he's divisive, and he's happy when we're uh, when we're arguing amongst ourselves, mm -hmm. and he's happy if he can prevent us from coming together. Like, you know, you should, you're you're aware, I think, that you know I've had all this computer problems. You know, I got I got viruses. My computer basically, I think, is ruined, and. Uh, I'm using my wife's computer now, and it's been hard to get it so that I can do basic things on it because it doesn't have all the programs that it should. Uh -huh. uh, and you know, there's a there's a saint on YouTube that uh, that has uh, contacted me. Did, are you aware of that about him helping me? Um, I'm aware that some saint did. I don't know who it is. So yeah, well, I'm not going to divulge it unless he he wants me to make his name known. But, yeah. but uh, uh, he. Uh, told me that uh, he has the means to provide hardware and software and technical support to me and and he, he, he I, there's a computer in the mail I'll be receiving it by Wednesday I think uh -huh. it's got all the programs that I need so that I can do what I do on YouTube yeah and then he'll give me technical support to as needed and so I I, I think that this is uh, uh, an answer to my wife said it's an answer to prayer, but huh. I said I said Cindy I I didn't pray specifically for someone to provide me a computer uh, uh -huh. and, and all this stuff and this help I didn't pray for that but I I pray all the time that Lord provide my needs uh -huh. and you know I you don't I don't think you have to be that specific I mean. If someone wants to be specific in their prayer, they they can spell it out exactly what they want or need. Uh -huh. But I, I think God knows. I, I pray for God to provide Brother Jackson's needs all the time. Well, thank you, Lou. I don't know what your needs are, Brother, mm -hmm. but I know that the Lord knows mm -hmm. better than I. If I was to try to spell it out, it, it would be feeble, feeble attempt to explain your needs. God knows them. Mm -hmm. So when I ask that, that God provide my needs or your needs, then uh, I see this as an example of it happening. Where, where uh, I, I think that this saint, uh, he not only understood by watching and, and seeing me do this work and then seeing these problems I'm having and knowing that he has the ability to help me, he was prompted by the Holy Spirit and the prayers answered in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't even remember how I got onto this topic we were talking about Satan and uh, wanting to divisive to, uh, yeah and um, and keep us apart oh yeah I know what it was uh, in, in this case Paul was saying Satan prevented him from going to visit these people that he wanted to see now should I conclude that Satan has prevented me from doing my work on YouTube because he caused these technical problems I don't know. Could it be the work of Satan? You know, uh, you know, uh, somehow causing viruses or you know, helping people or put viruses. You know, the people that are doing these crazy things and, uh, with viruses and and they're they're so malicious and they're so clever uh, what they're able to do. I mean, is Satan causing them? Is he um, behind their actions? Possibly. Could it be? It's possible. Yeah. Well, it seemed like Paul thought that Satan was behind, uh, you know, his some of his troubles. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, all right, brother. Let's uh, let's take the remaining a few minutes here. Talk about salvation because more than anything else, you know, I I I feel my my calling. The the Lord wants me to work in evangelism. Wants me to tell people the good news, yeah. and uh, 
maybe someone's watching now who either believes they're a Christian, uh, but they're confused about what you know what this good news is and what this what it what is expected of them to in, to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's somebody watching now that it, it doesn't even claim to be a Christian, but now they're they're interested. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're, uh, now they would say, well, "What is it? What, is, what exactly is a Christian? And what is it uh, required to become a Christian? And what's the benefit of becoming a Christian?" Yeah. So I'm going to give you the first shot at answering those questions mm -hmm. now, and then I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on it further. Sure. Uh, well, obviously, to become a Christian, Luke, you have to watch all 91 episodes of My Little Pony. <laughs> I did watch. I did watch the full first episode, and I I gotta admit, I did enjoy it very much. <laughs> Obviously, you gotta watch all ninety one, or God won't let you into heaven, right? I was actually surprised at how much I really enjoyed that. It was really a wonderful story about friendship. Yeah. Okay. So basically, here's the here's the the serious rundown of of the gospel message. God says that we're sinners that we've broken his holy law and that no amount of good works can ever make up for it. No amount of church attendance, water baptism, committing of your life to serving Jesus, none of that can, can help, merit, help us merit heaven in any way. Which is why God sent his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh and the Son of God, to die on a cross for our sins and shedding his precious blood as the payment for our sin debt. He died for every single person in existence and was buried in a tomb and raised from the dead three days later to prove his victory over death. And if you simply believe on him for eternal life, you are eternally secure, meaning you can never lose your salvation or give it back, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother. Thank you. Uh, I think that was a, a perfect explanation. Very concise. I mean, there's a there's a lot of arguments uh, uh, within the body within Christendom about uh, uh, exactly what a person needs to know, needs to understand, needs to believe. Uh, but I, I think you certainly told them. Uh, everything that they they really need to know, but that they they might have some follow up questions. Now let me ask mm -hmm. you to play the play the part of someone who would say, well, well, wait a second, I, you're you're saying that we're all sinners, but but what about what about the person that that says, oh, I I think I'm a pretty good person though, you know, I mean I uh, I I I'm pretty moral, I I I'm I'm trying to uh, uh, you know, f follow the the golden rule. You know, and and even the commandments. I I, I try not to break any of those commandments. And and, and uh, uh, don't don't you think God's going to you know accept me because I'm I'm pretty darn good person. Uh, the Bible says that there is not one righteous. No, not one. It says that it's not of works of righteousness by which we, which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. According to the Bible, no amount of good works ever uh, merit eternal life. Hmm. So, well, no matter how good I am, you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, I think it's important for that person to understand that that uh, when we evaluate ourselves and we if we are going to plead our case to God uh, and, 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 and and tell God you know why why he should let me into heaven and and look and we present our case as saying I'm pretty good and these are the reasons uh, when we when we look at goodness we, we think of it as uh, we're comparing ourselves to other people mm -hmm. now, if I want to if I want to uh, do that, I think I'm going to personally, uh, maybe I'm just full of pride and ego or something, but if I compare myself to other people, I think I'm up in the upper percentile as far as, you know, I, 
one of the better people. I, 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 as I look at other people, the way they live their lives, I think I'm pretty darn good. I'm high on the scale. But the problem is, uh, God is when, he, when God sees goodness, not as uh, how you compare to other people, but mm -hmm. how you compare to the perfect person, the mm -hmm. one perfect person. Jesus said he came down from heaven and, and he claimed to be God himself who mm -hmm. became a man and the scriptures tell us he lived a perfect life, he never sinned and mm -hmm. it says that the scripture says that we all fall short of the glory of God and the glor glory of God is perfection and Jesus mm -hmm. said go and be perfect so the standard that, that if you're watching this now and you want to go to heaven based upon personal merit the standard you have to meet is perfection. Mm -hmm. well, if you can honestly say that from the time you're born to until you take your last breath that you've never sinned once mm -hmm. and you've equaled what Jesus did, then then you'd, I think you'd probably be fine in the eyes of God. But can you honestly say that? You've never lost your temper. You've never been impatient. You've never been jealous. You've, you've never been dishonest. You've never had bad thoughts. You, even if you've never done bad actions, have you had any bad thoughts? Well, that's what would be required. You'd have to be perfect. And that's why the Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. Uh, so if a person can understand that their, uh, all of their efforts to appease God, to satisfy God, to please Him, to, to make themselves acceptable to God, no matter how hard we try, we fall short. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the first step to salvation, I think, is that realizing that uh, mm -hmm. we need to be saved. Uh, our attempts to work our way to heaven are futile. Mm -hmm. We need to just re realize and surrender and say, I give up. I cannot, no matter how hard I try, reach this level of perfection that is required for, to go to heaven. And once we realize that, we could cry out to God and say, God, I need help. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. You need to, to help me. You need to save me. And, and as you said, mm -hmm. God did something to solve this problem. And would you repeat exactly what he did? He, he sent his, his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh and the Son of God, to die on, on the cross for our sins and shed his blood as a payment for our sins. And Jesus rose from the dead three days later after he was after he died and was buried. Mm -hmm. So I talked about this transaction earlier in the in the in our discussion. We were talking about Satan. I alluded to this transaction that takes place, this imputation. Could you elaborate exactly what happens when a person puts their faith in Jesus? Uh, you know, as, as you as you explain it, two things happen. Mm -hmm. regarding sin and regarding righteousness. Right. Well, all of your sins, in my, in my view, are forgiven, but you're also, you also have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. He imputes his perfect righteousness to you, just as if you had never sinned and never will sin, even. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think now a person can begin to understand the concept of gospel. Gospel. It's a Greek word and it means good news. Now a person can actually see, wait a second, this is really good news. You meet, Are you telling me then, Brother Jackson, that if I believe in Jesus for my salvation, that that uh, my sins are, are forgiven because he paid for them and his righteousness is credited to me. I get credit for his righteousness. So we're kind of trading places. Exactly. He's he's the he's paid and paying for the sin that I did, and and I get credit I get the righteousness that he did. Mm -hmm. That's that's you know a great deal. Yeah, it's it's not even a deal because you pay nothing. Salvation yeah. is purely receiving and not giving. Yes, so it's it's entirely a gift, mm -hmm. and, and if it's a gift, that means that you don't have to work for it. You don't have to uh, because Jesus did all the work. You don't have to pay for it because Jesus paid for it with his suffering and death. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, it's all you've got to do is accept it. 
Jesus is offering it to everyone right now. It's like he has his, his hands out reaching to you to embrace, and you embrace him as your Savior, realizing that he paid for your sins and he's given you eternal life. And at that instant, what happens? You have eternal life. Yes. You receive eternal life. Mm -hmm. You also receive something else that's going to be transformative. What is that? The Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit of God, when you, the moment you put your faith in Jesus completely, the Holy Spirit of God comes and uh, connects to your spirit. It, 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 it indwells you. It's called the baptism of the Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. So now your spirit is regenerated and brought to life spiritually. So now you're quickened, the Bible says. Your, your spirit's brought to life. You're regenerated. And, and you're now what Jesus coined the term, you're born again. You're a new creature. You're a child of God. And the Holy Spirit not only regenerates you and lives inside you, but it, it seals. In this the Bible says the scripture, the spirit is sealed in you. And, and Jesus said he'll never depart. He'll, he'll never forsake you. Mm -hmm. So we don't ever have to worry about somehow at some point in our life, uh, mm -hmm. if, if our faith weakens or if our temptations get, get, a, get a hold of us, we don't have to worry that uh, mm -hmm. somehow Jesus is going to leave us and, and forsake us. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. I think we're pretty thorough there. So anybody watching now, if, if they've never received this gift of salvation and eternal life, uh, you know why you need it, you know how to receive it, and you know how wonderful it is. So how foolish it would be to reject it. Brother, uh, anything else you want to add to that before we close the live part of the broadcast? Um, I would just like to add, and this is to you too, Luke, that if you're curious, watch the video I just uploaded. I finally got it in the right format, and it's on my channel now, called Scientific Accuracy of the Bible. And um, tell me what you think of, of it, and maybe it could even help you if you're wondering is this is this realistic? Is this possible? Christianity and and whatnot. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm clicking the link right now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it into the watch later file. Mm -hmm. I have, so I definitely will watch that. Um, all right, brother. Well, uh, thank you for participating, and uh, we're just skimming skimming the surface on this topic of Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, We'll pick up where we left off, and, and once we've discussed the verses that hold the word Satan, mm -hmm. uh, we'll move on and look at the verses that, that have the word devil and, and anything else that to, to is used to describe this uh, character. Mm -hmm. Try to learn as much about you know what he's doing and how he is seen and portrayed in the scriptures so we can learn about him and, and you know de defend ourselves from him because... Mm -hmm. He is up to no good. He is up to trying to cause problems in our life and divisions in the body. Okay, brother, I'm going to end the live show now. So uh, to all the viewers, mm -hmm. bless you. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.